You just have to ask yourself, is someone abusing them or is there domestic abuse? Or are they hearing or thinking or witnessing this? Now, and there are um, age impacts of different ages in different ways. Even infants, we believe, can detect the atmosphere in the home. The same infants, unborn infants, detect things to do with mammy while they're in the room, you know, just prior to, to birth. But certainly in life, when they're born, if you like what we call life, um, young children can become very good. So the other little one, I saw, I was in a Atlantic Stand shopping centre the other day, but I love it, I'm going to go in there and whatever. Now, part of my car has gone over to the thing. And was this little boy about nine, very old boy, first probably so, at his first day. And his man, he was crying, and his man uh, was shouting and shouting at him. And at one point, I was watching, just watching, thinking, I wonder what's the story of that child. And as what the woman let an unmerciful loud, the like of or roar, the like of which I've never heard, and I've heard a lot of stuff in my life, personal and professional. At this child, it's like it would just wipe you out with the roar that came from the from man towards the child. And of course, he started to get more of, of the anti. So, if that child may well end up in cabs in a few weeks' time, he may be already on the list, and we'd all be saying, Why is he so aggressive? You have to actually ask yourself from a systemic perspective what happens in the dynamics in the house and in the dynamics in the relationships. Because I don't care who you are, if anyone born to be, um, you know, a lot older than that little boy, like you'd be so shocked to your boots with the kind of assault on your persona and on your personality. They just, uh, and that little boy would just stand out. And I thought, what is he going on to? Anyway, that's not in a judgmental way, that's in a, in a way of thinking about these things. So, toilet training, regression, you often see that in kids, uh, in younger kids. Teenagers, not attached to school, risk behavior, substance abuse, and so on. Always ask the questions. So in terms of emotional, you get fear, sadness, anger, protective of mother and sibling, won't go to school. Sometimes you find kids, adolescent boy or adolescent girl, girl or nine-year-old won't go to school and they're thinking school phobia and they're thinking this, that, that. Mommy, mommy, or daddy, or trying to recover from last night or whatever. And there can be anger and aggression towards the, the victim, if you like, as well. That, you know, the anger floats everywhere. It can be towards anyone. So, uh, social withdrawal and isolation. Look, the list is endless. Low self-esteem. Super responsible or super irresponsible. And either of them, we don't want super responsible to this. It's fine. It's fine in the circumstance of uh, life that a child would step up to the plate. Do you know what I mean? If, God forbid, daddy dies or, you know, mammy's sick or, or there is domestic violence and daddy's left or mammy's come out or mammy's left or It's fine to step up a bit and become responsible for a period of time. But it's important that that child, after a period of grieving or whatever, is allowed to be a child again. That they don't get set in the super responsible mode. I was probably a super responsible child, but I was allowed, you know, come back when the crisis was over. But then you get into super irresponsible kids who won't do their homework, won't go to bed, won't go anything, and they're just. So either can be symptoms, if you like, that we need. So in the
the mental health field then it can be cognitive difficulties, PTSD, say the list goes on. Peer relationships, I suppose the main thing I want to say about this, you can read the list yourself, but you often notice that kids who are living with or are in fear of, even if it only happens once in six months, children can be very afraid of domestic abuse and poor people, they're living with poor people, they won't invite a friend around because you couldn't possibly, because you never know when daddy's going to be in the room or mommy's going to go off to study or whatever. You can't go in the room. So you often get um, fewer interests outside of school and less involvement in social activities as well. Secrecy. Um, and we know that adults exposed to domestic abuse in childhood can experience depression and uh, other symptoms as they go into adulthood. But it's not uh, a dreadful story, right? It's not a story that if you've experienced domestic abuse, you are likely to uh, become depressed. It's not that, because we know that many children who are living with us also thrive beyond it. And we turn our tragedy, one can, into something that makes it even greater in the world. So, and this is where sometimes we can take a very prescriptive, if you've experienced domestic abuse, you're more likely to carry out domestic abuse. It's not a linear relationship. If you've experienced domestic abuse, you're li more likely to be depressed. Well, it might be more likely, but it's not a linear relationship. Because lots of factors, which I want to get to now, um, come in to mediate or mitigate the effects of these things. So it's not all poor outcomes. If any of you here in the room have experienced it, or your sister's living in a domestic abuse situation, you're worried about the kids. Actually, that happened one year with a student um, to one of these lectures. She came up and she said, my sister's living in a domestic abuse, and I'm terrified about my, my nieces and nephews. And I said, OK, and blah, blah, blah. And we, you know, the tree houses? Remember we did the tree houses? She went back and did the tree. The kids were coming to stay the weekend with her, uh, with herself and her mother. And her sister was go, going away with her husband was hard for the weekend. And she did the tree houses with the kids. And did and did this thing through the tree houses. But the kids were terrified of what was happening. And this girl who was a student started to make interventions. Talked to her mother, her mother, of course, felt the same. And then they talked to the sister. And eventually that girl, the sister, got away from her mom. Um, not easy and not, you know, but it was all through the you know, social that she ended up doing a little bit more of studying and blah blah blah. But yeah, with good outcomes. So it's not all poor outcomes, so let's let's say that. It's not all poor outcomes. And um, and we know that 30%, 37% of children have outcomes similar or better uh, than children who aren't exposed to domestic abuse. Because the only thing that happens to us in life isn't domestic abuse. There can be lots of other things going on. Yeah. Lots of financial stress, stress. I really fear for all these kids living in these uh, B and and rapid divisions. And I've said that before. We have we haven't even begun to get our head around the impact of this stuff. And we don't know what it is. Um, but anyway. Um, so children are not merely passive bystanders to events around them. They will make choices uh, to help them cope or to improve their situation. And one woman uh, who had experienced domestic said she had a friend whose mom and dad were really lovely. And so she used to arrange to go out with them on a Sunday. They had a car, this girl didn't have a car. And they'd go out with them on a Sunday, they'd do the strawberries and the press and the stuff. And she, she kind of imagined herself into that and all became part of their family on a weekend. And that helped her, uh, if you like, to do it with them. So children do all sorts of things. They develop strategies, and we all do. Um, and so resilience doesn't act as a protection against adversity. I won't ask, but I say there is a person in the room who hasn't, to a greater or lesser extent in our lives, 
so much adversity, right? It, because it's the human condition. People come into our lives, people leave, bad things happen, good things happen. We all have it, death, sickness, whatever. So being resilient doesn't protect us from that, but it just works to provide our ability to recover more readily from it. Therefore, preventing the impact in the long run. That's what resilience is. It doesn't protect us from the things in life that happen. It just helps us recover more quickly. And the factors that contribute to resilience in children are self-esteem. So please, with your own children, with your nieces and your nephews, with the children you work with and care on a level, think about their self-esteem. Don't undermine them. Don't even don't have pride. Don't denigrate their personhood. Any of you who want to hear a really fabulous interview, you know, some of you may have heard it, about the difference between self-esteem and confidence and fresh kids and all that, with Maureen Gaffney last Saturday, she's a psychologist, last Saturday on the Marion Finucane morning program. I don't know what it's called, between 11 in the morning, I think, on Saturday, and 11 in the morning on Sunday. And she did the most incredible interview with Maureen Gaffney. Uh, I don't know what the program is called, but on the distinctions between confidence and self-esteem and all that. The self-esteem is, is core. Uh, and if you can, from the time that infants are born, help them believe that they are a really good human being, that's really important. Good social skills help. Uh, supportive peer network. Kids that go to the football, any of you took my crying course, you know, a really good coach can help uh, mediate a lot of these things or mitigate. Um, so being involved in some kind of a really good, every Tuesday you go to the football or whatever it is. Secure attachments to either both parents and to the uh, grannies and granddads, wider community, uh, and to attach meaning. Very important. And that's why after an event last night, or a kickoff, or mommy crying, and daddy's gone out because he's just managed to slice her head off with what sometimes women talk about the leak of the tongue. Never touched me, but just slices my head off with the leak of the tongue. To be able to kind of speak to the kids and maybe help them say, you know, you're crying, you, you mop up your tears. I don't think daddy knows what he's doing when he says these things, you know, and sometimes he, he doesn't mean to hurt mommy, but it does hurt. But maybe I'll have a word with Nana, and Nana might be able to talk to Daddy. Not to do this, time. you know. But to help the kids age appropriately, try to understand it while you're trying to figure it yourself. And um, so, secure attachment to the non-offending, uh, so to speak, parent, and develop interventions, grandparents and others. Now, I just want, we've only two minutes, have we? Uh, two minutes. Post-separation violence is really something that you need to remember uh, in the end. When women leave, and when they leave with their children, it's not the end of the story. Because 76% there of women in that Women's Aid UK study uh, who separated suffer post-separation violence. And the man, or indeed the woman, will try and find them from there. And what we call uh, the weaponization of children, where children are used in the ongoing fight. I uh, won't say between, but used by the harassing parent against the other. So the courts are now having to get up to speed with this because the, court, the line of the family court until relatively recently was, well, he was a wife batterer, or he undermined his wife, or he abused his wife, but he's a good dad. So he should have access on Saturday and Sunday or Tuesday night or whatever it is. 
And what the research has shown us is that, first of all, I've tried to explain to you that children are impacted by virtue of being in the environment. So this idea of being a good dad, only undermining your mom is a good dad, is like nonsense because of the impact on children. And secondly, that what the research Stephanie Holt and company have shown is that the access visits become another way to get at the partner that they have, that the partner has managed to get with. And so it's called the weaponization. And so you, many of you know who have taken my crime course know that I'm a very strong advocate for restorative justice after sexual violence. But I'm not at all convinced about restorative justice in domestic abuse. For these very reasons, that the sexual violence, when it's done, it's done. It's over. Generally, even within families. But with this thing, it's all, women will tell us it's almost never over. I just find that very challenging because I don't believe in never anything. So I'm always working with women to say, no, it will be over. Because if he thinks he's above the law, he isn't above the law. So it will be over. Because the law and you and me and everybody will make it over. But the reality for a lot of women or men is that forever, there, the potential is for him to show up again to try to undermine the law. So the children can be used to that. I think I've probably said enough about that, uh, about the court. So there is a question for people who came in late. There is a question on courts for control and offender strategies. And there's a question on uh, services for impacting women and children. I think it would be exactly